Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna be recording it anyway. So okay. <sighs> yeah, cool. Well, uh, so you focus on software, or you cover all kinds of things? Uh, I cover all sorts of things. I mean, um, my focus primarily is going to be on on actually using it to make things. Mm-hmm. But obviously, obviously um, the people who make the tools, just like right. with, with what you're doing with the US Source College stuff, making the tools is just as important as actually using them. Yeah. Um, and so that there, there's a lot of tie-in for that. As far as I'm concerned. Yeah, uh, and you've seen my TED talk. Yes, I have. I have. Yep. But you uh, said you haven't heard about us before, so you, I guess I, you haven't I, looked a lot, a lot for hardware because we're all—I mean, we're all over the hardware space, right? Right, right. Yeah, I, I tend to tend to play a lot on the software side of things. Yeah. Um, like my my hardware either is gonna is either very much on the analog. I'm making stuff with like wooden knives and I'm not even touching anything that involves software or I'm 3d printing and that's pretty yeah. much where it where it ends for me and you know you know we're uh, we're actually selling 3d printers these days we, we've got them as products yep I saw that I saw that I was very intrigued by that yeah. um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be asking you in fact I have it written down right here yeah no we can cover a lot of different things but yeah go ahead or whatever uh, wherever you want to go Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, and I mean the way the way that I want I'd like to handle this is basically keep it very open, very conversational. Yeah. Um, I have a like there's a couple of boiler questions I'll probably ask if I can remember to ask them because I often forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I really just having an organic conversation about it. Yeah. Um, and and probably at some point if you if you mention anything in the show, I might make a note of it if there's a link to it or whatever. Uh-huh. Um, I might bother you to send me a link to whatever that is. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, hopefully this should all work. You you set and ready? You think? I'm, I'm ready. All yeah. right. Let's see what happens if I can get the recording to work here. Sometimes Jitsi takes a second to play nice with that. What do you call your beard style? Um. <laughs> I so so it's either monster chops or or a no T. <laughs> no. Tea. Okay. She's got a no T. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, everything except for what the goatee part is. Uh, Recording is on. Abraham Lincoln, oh. inspiration. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I don't have quite the top hat, but we'll see how that shakes out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I should probably make my phone quiet because I always forget to do that too. Not that anyone ever calls me, but it's worth my, worth doing. Yeah. All right. So it's recording now, which means that. All of this is for posterity, or for the cutting room floor. If it sucks. So, <laughs> Are you, do you publish both video and audio, or just video? Just I do. Audio? Yeah, I do. I've, oh, yeah. I've been putting both because yeah. it's um, cool. it works fairly really nicely. Yep. So also make sure that this is in good. That's in presentation mode. Uh, and I know you pronounced your own name on the TED talk, but I want to make sure I get it right. Martian. Like marching to the rhythm. Martian. Good. All right. Cool. Um, Jacobowski. Jakubowski, yep. Yeah. I'm getting there. <laughs> All right. So we're, let's um do about 10 to 20 seconds of room tone. That way, if there's any sort of noise thing, I can cancel that out. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. All right, shall we begin? Let's begin. All right. All right, everybody, today we have a guest. We have an interview. We have a guest in an interview. <laughs> With me, we have Martian Jacobowski from the Open Source Ecology Project. Is it, we go with project, project or? We go project. project. Um, and, and he's here to talk to us, actually, basically, all about that. So I, we'll go ahead and you tell us about ourselves, about not ourselves, yourself, Martian. OK, so yeah. I'm, open source ecology so we're working on essentially open source blueprints for civilization it's a pretty ambitious project started on like 2004 when as soon as i got out of uh, the university grad school in fusion physics and uh one thing i discovered in my program is that i was useless so after finishing the phd program i was all revving up to do good world work but uh, I felt that the farther I went into my studies, the more useless I felt. And certainly when I got out, out of the program, I was studying fusion energy. I wanted to do something concrete for making a better world. 
and um, started the Open Source Ecology Project, essentially about what it means to apply open, open collaborative principles to developing basically an operating system for society. How do we create a society that collaborates as opposed to competes or just ha goes through tremendous amounts of comp competitive waste? Because one thing I noticed that actually made me start the project during the university time was I couldn't talk openly to others about my work. We had some hot work. I mean, it was fusion energy stuff, uh, turbulence, crazy stuff. But um, when I noticed that, I thought, wow, this is that's interesting. And I was thinking about, well, uh, that's definitely preventing me from going where I need to in terms of educating myself and working openly with others, communicating, learning. And I thought if that if that happens even at the public institution at, at our universities, I thought this must be a pervasive problem. So so I, I was looking into that. I found out about Linux and open source software and then thought about, well, what would it look like if we applied that to hardware, to to generally to how we do things in society. So that's that was the origin of the project. Right on. Well, so I'm going to back up just a second there. So um, you're, you 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 stepped away from from fusion, which like, granted, I'm I don't have my, my studies are nowhere near that. Um, but you know, you, when someone talks about studying that, that 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 is the mindset. That is the sort of help the world with with this this with fusion power sort oh, yeah. of thing. And and like to to I guess that that is that so the the sort of lockdown yeah. nature is that kind of what pushed you in that direction, okay, or was so, it just like it's going slow? So okay, so there's a big point about uh, during the fusion program. I learned about what appropriate technology really means. I was initially interested in renewable energy and I thought, oh yeah, now, so I was interested in solar, I studied that a little bit, undergrad, and I did a thesis actually on increasing the efficiency of solar cells. And then I thought, oh yeah, next thing, fusion, well, what if we could make our own suns on a planet, wouldn't that be awesome? Great. So as soon as I got into the program, I got decked with um, a bunch of theoretical studies and, and found pretty quickly that uh, the stuff that we're studying is very far from reality yet, and in fact, I mean, it's the running joke is it's going to be 10 years in the future, it always was and it always will be, but <laughs> um, that's, the idea there is, I mean, there's some fundamental physics issues, it's, it's a really hard problem, but it made me think, it made me think, well, what about stuff that already exists like the so solar power that throws at us 10,000 times more power than we already use, why not go back to that? So. Uh, what happened was I actually was started doing outreach about fusion energy. I got questions like yours. Okay, so how good is this? Is it, you know, what's the benefit to humanity? And of course, one 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 answer was that well, it's not here yet. But the second question that people asked was, well, what about the radioactivity? Because actually, that, that that issue you still have to resolve. This is like this is nuclear. It's not like nuclear fission, which is much more polluting. But fusion does still have the untractable issue of high energy neutrons making radioactive anything they come in contact with. There is no physical law that allows you to negotiate that that we know of. There will be neutrons and there will be radioactivity. So people started asking that question and I started thinking, yeah, hmm, that's interesting. They're actually right. This is not here yet. It's it's not, a, not going to be an appropriate technology if we do do it. And, and the one thing that bothered me about it is that it would be another hugely centralized power source. I was just about to mention that's so that totally central centralized distribution. It's not yeah. not decentralized at all. Yeah. So that's um, that's the story on a fusion. Thinking about appropriate technology uh, made me think that well, this is not it. Uh, and then I started studying, just kind of uh, get on my own path in terms of looking for what really is meaningful and important. Very cool. And so you ended up taking your way to was it? Was it it's northern U.S. Minnesota? No. That was yeah, Wisconsin yeah. University, of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Madison. That's the fusion okay. program. Yep. Cool. Yeah. I, I, for anyone, by the way, you should go check out open open source ecology org. There's actually a lot of that information there, and this TED talk is really good too. So you should check that out. Yeah. Um, but there's also stuff on there that I have questions about. So one of the biggest projects for open source ecology, as far as I can tell from the website, is the, 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 the blueprints for, for, for civilization, right? These, these machines that, that yeah. um, you're prototyping and putting plans out for. And there, there's a listing for them here on the site. Yeah. I was just looking at it before, yeah, we, so 50, before we started. Basically take 50 of the most important machines that we think it takes for modern life to exist 
everything like a tractor, a circuit maker, production equipment, renewable energy equipment, a car, even a house. I mean, that's a, that is a technology we live with. So looked at selecting some of the most imp critical technologies that will allow anybody to prosper. And the idea there is let's talk about appropriate technology, how technology truly serves human needs so that we're not spending most of our time just trying to make a living but prospering. So that's one of the myths. Uh, the myth of technology is still here. It's like uh, it says that, oh, yeah, our life is absolutely easier and we can all relax at the beach. But no, I mean, the, with the more advanced technology, it seems like we're working harder and harder. And part of that is the how things break down, like this planned obsolescence and other issues, just issues in the way technology is made, proprietary, competitive, not lifetime design that needs to needs to change otherwise we're always trying to keep up with the technology instead of technology serving us well and there's, there's also the, the 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 efficiency barrier right so the 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 myth is that when tech when you have a technology that gives you more time to do stuff you're, you're magically going to have more time to do stuff which what what that basically means is no you're going to use the same amount of time just doing different stuff yeah. um and and so you you end up doing just as much if not more work based on the, the technology making you more efficient yeah, and, and the idea there is we, we kind of have to stop and think about that a little bit and think about what our true needs are. And first of all, but at the same time, I mean, most of the world right now is still deprived of that very basic productive technology. So that's the other area to address, allowing access to a modern standard of living anywhere in the world. Yeah. So of, of these 50 different machines or technologies, um, I, there's there's a I didn't get the number here. How many are, 50, there's, on the web page? There's, there's, there's 50, fifty total, but on the page you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, in pro, yeah, that's just in prototype stage. I'm looking yeah, at the, the prototype. There's a you can look at so on our we we, we uh, have a wiki open source ecology dot org slash wiki. You can look at a state of completion. There's an infographic. So we prototyped about twenty five or so of the machines already. We're busy um, getting products out into the marketplace it's actually a lot of the work to date has been around prototyping and right now we're at the stage where we're shifting to okay let's do some business development so that we can bootstrap fund the project because once again in open source you have to start talking well who's going to pay your bills at some point you're going to have to create meaningful revenue models so we're really shifting to the enterprise development aspects these days well, then you also talk about, I guess you would need to talk about the, the tools to make these tools, right? Yeah. I mean, you guys have a, a, a 3D printer that yeah. you've, you have designed. Actually, you're selling it now, right? Yeah, yep. That's um, right. But so, there's also the, the raw materials. It's not just going to be made out of ABS or PLA. There's also right. metal that's involved with that. And then, you know, if you're, if you're making a, a house or whatever, you know, yeah. you have the raw materials, you get the wood, but you also have to have, you know, saws or, or yeah. hopefully power tools to put it together. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the Global Village construction sets, set operates on different levels. So one is uh, you've got production tools that can make machines, but also you have to talk about materials, as you said. So for example, the capacity to melt down steel in an induction furnace and roll it into virgin metal, that's part of the set. And then you can take your precision machining equipment and then make finished parts like engines and hydraulics. So that is all in there. You have to address the the materials issues and actually we have the, the most advanced technology in a set is is uh, aluminum extraction from clay well because oh. uh, clay is one of the most abundant or uh, aluminum is the third most abundant element is it i think the third most abundant element in the earth's crust and what if you can create technology that allows you to do that on a decentralized scale so think about essentially take any parcel of land and take the natural resources that are there like sand to make silicon and PV and semiconductors or aluminosilicate, which is clay to make aluminum. So think about that whole ecology of how we do that in a way that's, uh, that creates a circular economy is good for the environment and everybody wins. So instead of that huge centralization, uh, then we can talk about distributed economies to benefit more people. And so these pieces these these machines, the the plans for them, they're under. They're what license are they? Is yeah, a Creative, creative Commons, license? Commons by share alike. So viral clause on those software is typically GPL. But yeah, just uh, make access available to anybody. We're very particular about 
the nonsense with the non-commercial clauses like a lot of people these days call their open source-ish projects open source even though they're under the non-commercial licenses which is a lot there's just a lot of um, illiteracy in terms of what open source really means but yeah we're absolutely uh, committed to that we go a step further we also talk about the the step beyond the blueprints and that is enterprise so what we design is not only that you can you can have the open source blueprints for the printer but how do you run an enterprise for producing these printers so that mm. is the production engineering the facility layout tooling bills of materials supply chain and all that we document all of that too because we're interested in a world where there's more entrepreneurs more capacity everywhere and we actively train people to be our competition we think that is good the more people you have the more collaborators you have we look at people as collaborators not not to the enemy so uh, that concept is called distributive enterprise and we've published that since about 2013 um, and we really stick to that but we really don't know of anybody else who does this kind of work where they're actually actively promoting others and training others to get into the in, uh, open source enterprise that's that's a big deal i think it's right, extremely yeah. important i think that's the next evolution of the human economy towards distribution we know right, how and to you'll, things we've got yeah, to distribute you'll, the, the, you'll the product see, yeah and i mean you'll see this in in the the um on, on the creative side of things especially if you look at like like audio uh, and, and and some like photo and images as well you'll see yeah it's released under a creative common license but it's it's non-commercial and no derivatives right. well, what's what's the what's the point yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it just blows my mind because I mean if you think about it you know just stop and think about it. it's like wow just think about how many people are reinventing the wheel over and over again and that's you know that's how I felt uh, so going back to my PhD, I thought, okay, I can't really talk to other people. I got to go in and maybe research it myself and just repeat something that people have already done. Why? And then apply that to, okay, for example, the tractor that that I I b bought that kind of started the whole notion of lifetime design, where the tractor broke, I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again, and pretty soon I was broke too, like I talk about in my TED talk. Right. I mean. To make well, a even. design closed source that no, everybody, so many different companies have to compete to reinvent the wheel instead of collaborating to make something bigger, better, solve a bigger problem. That is what blows my mind. That's that's what we're passionate about: solving bigger problems. Let's get together and solve bigger problems. Yeah, they were talking about that with um, was it John Deere has oh, yeah. like yeah, yeah, closed yeah, yeah. firmware that you know if, if you it's the sort of the, the I think I forgot which state it was but they were really trying to push through a sort of right to repair um, clause and that yeah that got a lot of like lobbying pushback on that um, yeah so. yeah I mean you see that, that that was an interesting example where if you buy a tractor that you can't even you know fix it or look into the software I mean, you don't really own it. It's really about who owns you, who owns your equipment. Yeah. Well, speak, speaking about software, so two parts of this. One is the, the software that you use for, for the designs, but the other, the other part is, um, before I get to that, mm. is there, are, are there, besides, as part of these machines, are, are there software components? Absolutely, sure. Like, of course, uh, the 3D printing uses Marlin, all of that, for the brick press for example the compressed earth block press that we make there's arduino code that runs it so yeah uh, if you've got mechatronic devices yeah there's code that control code that's a common occurrence right on and so but the the mul the bulk of these plans are freecad freecad is, is that's FreeCAD? it so freecad now is uh, at a state where it's it allows us to do all that we do what, what we actually are doing with freecad is because it's open source we're creating new design workbenches. So right now, you can download the the 3D printer design workbench in FreeCAD, and you can start designing different iterations of our 3D printer. And that's the beauty. That's something we could never do with proprietary software. For sure, for sure. What? Well, and that's actually kind of FreeCAD is one of those things. I'm a I'm a Blender guy, so awesome, yeah. <laughs> so so FreeCAD is. This it feels weird saying this because Blender has the history of being this this. Uh, painful interface to get around but yeah. now that I have my, my my whole head wrapped around it yeah. trying to like shift gears back to more of a CAD mentality and, and working with FreeCAD um, there's there's 
there's there's some weird stepping off points for for me because it's you know you you before you, I guess let me put it this way when I typically go in I typically go in and I just start sort of scribbling and making free cred to, for me feels like you have to be a bit more planned in how you start working on it uh -huh. is that an accurate well I mean so the free cred work, workflow for me is the sketcher where you really get to doodle in that and then extrude that so um, now I'm also not a not a blender guy but I, I am trying to learn blender uh, basically where you take yeah you start with your blocks and just start manipulating I guess uh, sculpting them but I do find like with the FreeCAD Sketcher, you can design any kind of complex d geometry in 2D and then make it into 3D. And then you can take any of the sides and make features upon features until you get any kind of geometry that you like. So conceptually, that's, that's a very simple concept I can wrap my head around and it's, it's, it can design anything, yeah. You know what, you th I think you just, just cracked it for me because I, I tend to start, if I'm, I'm in a program that's naturally 3D, I'm going to start working in 3D on it. Yeah. But starting starting with the 2D sketch and, and extruding it out and playing with it makes a lot more sense. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, now I now I have more stuff to play with. Well, actually, <laughs> uh, you know, people that is a barrier, uh, especially with people who have experience with CAD, because they're saying, no, I'm not going to learn free CAD because it's it's different and weird. But the thing is, we have more success with novices learning FreeCAD. Like, I can teach somebody to do the basic workflow to design any geometry in about an hour. And they can actually start producing things for 3D printing and whatever. We've done that. Yeah, you, you actually see that with a lot of open source uh, packages. That if you, anybody who already has a workflow in mind, you know, yeah. you, see, you see this with like Photoshop and someone trying to pick up GIMP or somebody who knows Illustrator trying to pick up uh, Inkscape. And like, they're trying to, yeah, like ham-fistedly work their their old workflow yeah. into this other tool, and it, it's not it's a it does the same thing, but it works and thinks differently. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I I apparently fell into that exact same trap myself just now. Curses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think uh, that's interesting because um, like so we have OSE Linux, which is basically the distribution with all the software that we use. But I find that it's useful to just like any any piece of software will have okay this is you have to conceptualize it in your mind and get your mind around okay what is the basic principle of how that works the workflow works and once you get that then learning the mechanics of that is okay you just go through the motions but you have to stop and and kind of think about that and get that around your head and that way you can actually learn so many different packages and be fluent in all of them you just have to understand like the basic principle behind them so oh, actually, hold on a second. Do you, do you have a Linux, Linux distro? I didn't even see Yeah, we do. See we have OSC there. Linux 1.0 and then 2.0 that's just coming out like next week or next two weeks. So is basically we populated... Of... So, say that again? Uh, so, so is that, is that, that a spawn off of another distro? Oh yeah, yeah. So actually we, used, we built it on top of Ubuntu for the first one and we're going off Linux Mint for the second one. But it's basically a distribution that's got all the software, including, for example, like the FreeCAD workbenches that we created. It's already preloaded, so you don't have to spend all this time configuring and downloading like 10 or 20 programs when you work with us. Basically we want it to be like if we do, so we do large-scale collaborative design. If we do that, we want to give somebody the USB stick and they, they have all the software that we always use right there and then we can get busy collaborating. And do you use just the, the, the Mint or Ubuntu uh, repos or do you have your own sort of repo stack as well? Um, yeah, we're, we just download the right packages, create the thing. We, we don't really have, we don't have that yet. We don't have like a full repo. We just pretty much download the stuff off the web and make our can our distro. Yeah. That's super, well, actually, because, because yeah, you, you were talking about these large scale collaborative things. things. And on your website, website, you guys had a. Was, let me look at my notes real quick to make sure that I, I wrote it over here. Oh yeah, so you're the Steam Camp. Yeah. Um, you had that back in March. Did that act, that happened right around the whole COVID thing? Yeah. Did that actually, actually happen or? It did happen in March. I actually went out to New Zealand. There was a session in the United States. So, um, but since COVID, we, we quit that since we can't do that in person. But we are actually going to run another one in September where it's, we're just going to ship out the OSE dev kits, including the 3D printer kit, to people so that we can do that remotely. So basically learn, learn to design things for 3D printing, learn to build your own 3D printer, learn how to make your own microcontroller, do a little programming, maybe a little power electronics experiment. So yeah, just hands-on skills that you can use to make real things. Very, so, 
you have these camps, you have, and you, they're obviously they're they're, they're well attended. Where where does where's the community hang out? That um, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, we have a dev team. Uh, we have our OSC. Maybe like if you talk about con ongoing communication, that would be open source ecology workshops Facebook page. That's probably the best place. And we're just actually setting up discourse forums. We had other forums that we kind of trashed a couple of years ago because they got out of control. But yeah, we're we're getting back on discourse to get that community going back again. Mm -hmm. yeah, discourse is, is really nice. Um, yeah. Coming from someone that managed one forum in, in PHPDB and then moved over to VBulletin, Discourse is like head and shoulders, yeah. way more tools for preventing exactly what you're talking about, preventing the forum from either being overly inundated with, with spam and, and, and the wrong things or just sort of toxic attitudes that, that yeah. tend to go with it. So Discourse is really great for that. So I have yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Well, we're doing that. I think we can do a lot to basically like make that correlate to the wiki quite closely, so that we use the forums as a way to to uh, really push the development effort forward quite a bit. Yeah. Well, so how how big? Is, I mean, you don't have the forum, but you have the Facebook side of things, and you have uh, you, know, you you said you're you're basically everywhere in sort of the hardware space and the open source hardware space and, and those yeah. sort of things. Um, I guess, do you, do you have a sense of the scale of, of the community? I mean... Yeah. I mean, see, we we don't have, uh, like, a really established organization as it's a bunch of people that come and go. It's a volunteer-run organization, so there's, like... We have, like, three or four full-time equivalent in terms of volunteer effort. I'm abs absolutely full-time on this. My partner is doing Open Building Institute work, which we're collaborating on. But that's the thing we're aiming to crack right now and we just started our program to train people to run OSE chapters in different locations we actually have one person from South Africa applying right now but the perennial thing has been you've got volunteers that come and go you know you're gonna who's paying your bills is the idea so right, right now we're actually uh, for the OSE chapters we're training people okay how do you run and build the 3d printers that you can produce that you can run workshops around that you can run the steam camps with so we're really getting serious at the the livelihood part because after all it's got to be the mass creation of right livelihood that's going to make this project grow because right now we're not we're not growing uh like i would like um and we're addressing that by really pushing the enterprise side forward i meant i mentioned that the, the products so right, you, right. so you start with a full tool chain like we're starting with a 3d printer that's a established technology but the good thing is we're going to be producing parts for example for the cnc torch table for cutting metal or the filament maker shredders uh, shredder parts or rubber tracks for the tractors that's the kind of stuff we talk about so we start with the printer and that that we're getting to a fully developed product so our next steps on it actually is a four by eight four by four by eight foot large-scale 3d printer because a lot of the technology we design is scalable like the motion system universal axis you can scale that the, we pay a lot of attention to scalability and modularity so if you understand right. the pattern for the small printer you use bigger parts and similar design pattern to make a much bigger one so for example we've made like a 4x8 torch table already uh, with the printed parts uh, that were scaled up and the whole motion system was scaled up and things like that so that's there's a whole product ecology of how you go from so you start with the 3d printing you then go to the metal work precision machining and bootstrapping your whole technology set yeah so so i guess that would that would that leads me in sort of the, the next thing is that, so of 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 these designs that you that you mm -hmm. have these machines that you have there's 50 of them there they're in various states how soon do you think you'll have Ah, all of them either yeah. in prototype or like as viable things okay so this is the status uh uh status uh status of completion page on a wiki we're about 30 percent done so one third 2028 is the magic answer so right now we're about one third but that means a lot of work left 2028 is essentially the cutoff we're set, setting to, okay, we're going to be done with whatever we have. Right now, we're spawning the larger collaborative development processes. Like, actually, right now, we're, we're working on a major, major effort. And that, so let, let me talk about that for a second, because we're seeing that, okay, you can only do so much. We've been at it for a decade. We're like one third done. Initially, right. when I hit the TED talk on the stage, I thought we'd be done in like two, 
two years because of all the flood of influx of people interested and so forth. But then you learn, oh, that's called management and enterprise and wasn't ready for that. <laughs> uh, so, so having upped my skill set on the enterprise side, we're really going at that. So the next step in our work is to address, when you think about it, what is happening with open hardware? There's not a lot of good example of effective open hardware product releases, and that's that's the perennial issue. It's hard to get people to show up. Uh, so how do you motivate people to do that? And we're saying, okay, let's create an event. And so this is what we're planning for about uh, next summer. Not not this summer, but next summer. So an event, we're going to handpick 2,000 people with a collaboration architecture of people for the right, right skill set and roles to deploy the open source micro house. So it's the seed home. Like I actually live in a seed home. This is the seed eco home. I can send you a link on that. It's a nice, pretty house. Yeah, sure. uh, but we started the Open Building Institute and we learned about modular building construction. So we're going to take that project to completion and the release of a viable thousand square foot house that you and a friend can build in one week for $50,000. So like this event is going to be a three-day weekend event. We get we gather all the people and develop. It's largely documentation, but everything around the business side. So how do you develop the website, marketing, copy, uh, distribution, and all all the assets for starting a business? And we're going to publish that. So imagine two thousand people, twenty-four hours. So it's twenty-four thousand hours, twelve man years compressed into a weekend. Can we do it? So that is a huge experiment but the goal is to address the thing that we're saying at the end of this we're going to release this product so this is a crazy experiment but this is literally what needs to happen because none of the it's so rare that a hardware project gets to the finish line yeah uh, there, yeah. there is a the giant sort of logistical thing with um with de managing that large of a team yeah but um what one of the oh, things absolutely. that i found from from stuff that crazy stuff that I've done in the past yeah. um, that got knocked out in a weekend was, yeah, people, especially when you're dealing with people who are volunteers, you really need to you do things that, that that value their time, right? And so if you can do things that are, um, well, if you, if, you, if you can say, all right, your commitment is limited to this weekend, people are way more interested, way more willing to say, all right, I've got 48 hours, I can throw at that yeah. and throw as much as I can into it. It's the same thing you see with like the, the sort of high intensity interval training workouts where it's like, oh, you can do anything for 20 seconds, right? Oh, well, then they're, they're puffing and puffing at the end of it. But <laughs> but that's that's the sort of thing where um, you get this this that sort of sprint mentality yeah. everybody gets on board as long as you have sort of all of the infrastructure and logistics in place so that yeah. when you inevitably run into like a hiccup or a trip or or fall or or because it's going to happen but if you have the, yeah. the the systems in place to handle that especially with that number of people then you just sort of keep striding on and everybody's got a lot of energy to make these things happen yeah um, what was your experience with the event what what happened there so it, I've did it four times in the past. It's been a long time since I did. It. So are, there's the uh, the 48 hour film project. I don't know if you're familiar no, with this. No, no, tell me this, more. I don't, I don't even know if they're still doing it. I'm pretty sure they are. But this was well over a decade ago that I was doing it. Um, the 48 hour film project is what it sounds like. You have two days, a weekend, basically, to produce a film. Okay. Um, okay. I had the I had the crazy and the film. Well, I had the crazy idea of okay, I'm gonna, we're going to produce an animation in that period of time. Um, in and, and well, that of course, but the idea is we're going to produce an animation that period of time. The the catch there is that the minimum running time, the minimum minimum length of that film, has to be four minutes long, mm. which in animation terms is an eternity. Mm. It's a lot to produce in um, in such a it's a wow. lot of footage to produce in such a short period of time, and ended up I, I did it four separate years in a row and we, we finished it twice out of those four but we ended up with a team of like 30 some people spread out internationally mm. um and we were broadcasting what we were doing live we had all sorts of cool things working wow where yeah i mean the only downside and i'm going to tell you this right now the only downside is that i really enjoy the the the, the art of animation and doing animating and rigging but because i sort of um, was was leading the project. Um, I didn't get to do the actual work part as much. I spent mm. a lot of that time managing traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you when you when you act as a producer for a sprint like that, where you're trying to get so much done in such a period, a short period of yeah. time, you 
you end up doing a lot of control, like delegating and getting people to do the right thing at the right time. And then if something drops through, okay, you work really fast to sort of fill in that gap by yeah. yourself and then, then move on to the next thing. Um, well, but, uh, maybe we you can help us collaborate because actually video production is going to be part of that. So in that 24 hours, there's going to be a big effort of animation and video to get the the prototype builds. We're going to build the thing, all the prototype modules in that time. So we're going to need video and animation for explainers and all of that. So maybe you can help us. Yeah, I mean, that. look me up. If you, what's that next year? Well, we, we could talk about that. That'd be fun. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, and that's because that was that was actually in in realm of my next question is because like how are you gonna get these things be made? Because obviously if you've been doing it for ten years and you're thirty percent the way there, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you're either going to be keep you're either gonna keep waiting, or you're gonna have to do something like sprints or yeah. or something along those lines. So I was curious about how that was gonna work out. Um, well, that that is exactly that. So now think about how do you coordinate much larger events that yield a product. So the experiment for next year, that's going to be a big, big experiment. It's, it's all about enterprise development and compressed time. So right now we're getting the 3D printer enterprises up and going. So that's bootstrap funding. And we simply, as you said, we have to accelerate. So we're looking for ways of how exactly do you do that? It's, it's not an easy thing. Like when you're dealing with hardware, it's much more, it's, I would say it's like a thousand or a hundred thousand times more complex than software. Um, but yeah, um, we're working on it and, and we're giving ourselves till 2028 so we've got about eight years left uh, but to finish meaning to the level of a distributed distributive enterprise for each of the projects that you can make a living I'm um, building a car building houses building tractors building 3d printers or whatever so all those have to be turned into enterprises so I guess the related to to that effort and related to getting that to happen. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of people who listen to this show, we have people who are, who are, I have a pretty interesting sort of spectrum of people listening. We have everything from people who are really, like, or just, they're just interested in open source and, and everything dealing with, with open culture and those mm -hmm. sort of things. We have people who are, who are very interested in just technology and, and those sort of things. Of course, you know, it's the open source creative. So we have a lot of people who do creative work, who, you know, write video, animation, music, these sorts yeah. of things. So yeah. the other two sort of, because it's open, because it's, it's open source ecology. Because they have the technology. Because they have the, um, the, the, the open source angle on that. That where they fit those 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 sorts of people where they fit is great. But on the creative side, if if somebody listening to the show, for instance, was interested in helping you out, what what do you need the most? What's what's um, aside from making like just making it happen? What sort of what sort of skills do you do you think if if I wanted to contribute to to this project, where where would I slot in? Business right? where, development. What, what could I do? Unfortunately, it's business development, or fortunately, business development and marketing. Because we've got so many different prototypes and things that we have done. For example, the house. That's ready to be a product. And that's why we're doing that, uh, productizing that next summer in our extreme first Extreme Enterprise event. The Extreme Enterprise concept, by the way, is like that's only like a month old here. But we're really focusing on, okay, studying what we have done what is missing and it's clearly the the finished product the enterprise the people showing up but showing up to get to that final product so we've got the houses you, you, I'll, I can send you a links so people can look at we've got the micro tractor we've got the tractors that we have built we've got the 3d printers the houses uh, CNC circuit mill all these things that are ready to be turned into good businesses and that's the level we're working at right now. So there's copywriting, there's marketing, there's product product development at this point. I mean, we've got an amazing amount of substance for, I mean, the technology works and the, the modular kind of uh, Lego set like design where we make, we focus on modules instead of finished machines. That gives us extreme flexibility. Like for example, with a tractor, the same principles we use to build a tractor, we build a backhoe or a bulldozer. Um, or a bobcat or whatever so so it's a very generative set it's it's about taking that to the last last mile of product development I mean that's really the the thing and but that's a huge thing that requires every just about every job from creatives to business development marketing copywriting I mean technology so I, one of the things that, that strikes me is what about making this making things with these things right and so yeah 
from the art side of things, you talk about a brick press. I'm like, okay, what if I what if I put a mold in that and I I do a a brick that's, you know, making a mold of whatever. Maybe I make a 3D sculpture, print out a mold for that, and then do the brick press with that. Um, you have a CNC on here. You know, it's CNC. You can do cool manufacturing stuff, but um, maybe you can make just cool sort of a, a, a wall relief sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Those sort of things are. I mean. I, mean, I don't I know it, it's it sort of strikes me a little bit as as um granted there's the there's the the blueprint for society where where you're you have the functional side of it but if, i mean there's art there's 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 doing yeah. things that's not necessarily intended for so like if you want to take you know you're talking about uh, aluminum extraction or even like like smelting oh I'd, if i if i if i had the the facilities for 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 melting steel at home and making crazy stuff out of steel there that that that, that that's that would be fun <laughs> right. Well, what you're saying is that there's the opportunities are endless, right? Uh, in, in terms of more artistic products as well. But once again, like in in the world of business, everything is nothing, right? You have to focus on okay, let's develop one thing after another. An idea is uh, what we're really working on is creating that collaborative literacy where uh, we found that one of the biggest blocks is uh, for collaborative development is that it's hard for a person to imagine that together there's enough for everybody the abundance mindset that oh yeah we can all do better doing that so that's one of the things we're really struggling with like why isn't the obvious happening like uh, just amazing enterprise development just take take within our project the stuff we already have like say the 3d printer um, to give you an example uh, 2008 when we first did the brick press I thought okay once we publish this, this is gonna go wild people are gonna start massive enterprise everywhere and no it doesn't work like that there's a big difference between here's a prototype ready to be a product and and then actually starting an enterprise productive enterprise either house building or building machines that's a much much bigger journey so yeah well, the, the, the challenge there is yeah. it's the same challenge you actually run into where on like if I'm making animation for television production, or I'm yeah. making illustration for for magazines or a website, you know the 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 argument always of why to use open source tools can never just be the accessibility conversation, which is unfortunate because that's a big component of it, right? That's 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 like one of the big things: accessibility, avoiding vendor lock-in, being able to have this decentralized thing where you always have on, you're guaranteed ownership of what you do. Yeah. But from from this this. The business side of things when you're doing freelance work or those sort of things it's like oh you know i i charge this much and whatever yeah i can just pay for photoshop to to do whatever i can just pay for maya to do whatever i need to do because that's the business side of thing and on on the you know you're going to talk if you're talking about like the brick press it's like all right so you have people who are yeah you, you could buy bricks or you could buy a an industrial scale brick press um what what's i guess that's the the question that not to be businessy been, oh, businessy uh, is but like the value proposition so the fact that you can do this um on your own that has to is, is that going to be enough yeah. to, to no no to that see out? that's not that's not it that's we're competing with industry standards that means we're going to build things that are cheaper better faster than the normal product so our brick press has to produce as many bricks as the commercial brick press but we do it at one-fifth the cost our tractor has to have the same horsepower and capacity. Our printer has to be be as good or better. So we're not talking about, uh, like the DIY case is one application. You can take our blueprints and make this stuff. But the other thing is starting enterprises where you're producing things on an open market, like a Lulzbot or Prusa 3D printer. Those are open source commercial products. So we're talking about that, that, that stuff that's good enough to start an enterprise with. Does that answer the uh, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. And so I guess that's 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 really that the the differentiator then is is I guess yeah getting getting because it just took me half of this conversation to to, to wrap my head around. Well, that. you have to wrap so. your head around. This is cheaper, better, faster, stronger for the same products. That's why for me it's like my mind is blown. Why do not people understand that? Um, well, and that's like, that's the classic thing we've had on the open source side for 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 over you know, for decades now is like. So you, so I get this for free. What's the catch, right? That's the natural inclination. So it's, what's mm -hmm. the catch? What's the, what's the thing? And like usually, and this is I think where, I think, for your for 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 your project, mm -hmm. building up the community is mm -hmm. is such an important component of that. And yeah, really yeah. having having the community with home because 
that's that's the if there's anything that's there's a gotcha in all of that it's where's the support come from right and so from oh, an enterprise yeah. standpoint oh, yeah. yeah i'm going to provide commercial support for whatever for for the 3d printer that i produce or for the tractor that i produce for my community and those sorts of things um and then if i scale that out then i'm going to be the one on the hook for for providing that support but oh, who's yeah. going to support that person right and being able to I, that's where i think the the value of having that that community really fleshed out is going to help absolutely so that the community definitely can help in the support side absolutely through forums or otherwise but yeah we have to be very deliberate about building those functions into the businesses yeah mm -hmm. very cool but I mean cool. so the thing to figure out here is like that that we're struggling with is like what are the incentives because clearly you can get better faster cheaper stronger kind of deal uh, but it's hard to convince people that that's the real case well we're struggling with 200 years of industrial history where everything has been proprietary for one and people think that competition or just like patents or whatever is a law of nature. No, it's not. So w let me go back to the to the ultimate incentive. What if you can collaborate on a development process where you're guaranteed that you're gonna have that product at the end of the day? So it's like basically like pre-funding a Kickstarter or whatever, but that's exactly what we're trying to tap with the extreme enterprise model. So the 2000 people that are gonna participate in that guess what each one of them like what is the strongest motivation the, the most true stakeholder in that process is the person that's going to get that house so those two thousand people are going to get their house for fifty thousand dollars that is uh -huh. the ultimate catch do you think we can attract the two thousand people to do that i think so it's going to be a big organizational process a lot of uh, scrum agile theory and extreme manufacturing theory put into practice uh, but that's a, that's an experiment w worth doing, for sure. Well, and I think I think the the those two thousand people. I think you're specifically going to need to be looking at um, sort of the people with with more of an entrepreneurial mindset, right? It's if 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 your your idea of of life is getting up, going to work for somebody else to do their thing and then coming home and then doing something else. I don't know if that sort of mindset well, is going to fit with this, right? Okay. So the requirement for those 2000 people are not an entrepreneurial mindset. It's a subject matter expertise. We're going to say, Hey, you're the guy that does technical documentation or the blender guy. That's going to do the exploded part animations for this house. Uh, we need you. You get this house at the end of the day that you can buy that we will do there is an element of enterprise and right now we're currently thinking that out of those 2000 there's going to be a crew of about a hundred that are pursuing the enterprise track meaning that they're going to learn more enough so that they can actually take this on as a business producing these houses for others right now all i know is that i will be with open source ecology be learning that skill set so that we can train more people to do that but the 2000 people you're not you know to make to get an entrepreneur, subject matter expert, super cooperator, uh, in all those areas, it's harder. Right. If you had the yeah. enterprise requirements, so here it's mostly like subject matter experts in all the different the radical modular breakdown of the house into modules and then into the enterprise development modules. That's subject matter expertise. But yes, um, th that's a good question because uh, I was struggling with it. How do you? This does sound like an enterprise. Uh, layer event but it's not really the people we're uh, we're attracting to it is mostly stripped of that requirement because there's just not so many entrepreneurs out there I, i'd say yeah it's it's definitely more of a um there the entrepreneurial mindset population is, is overall a smaller subset of, of general human population yeah. so yeah that trying to trying to trying to well here's the other tough part i guess is mm. you said you're gonna do this next summer yep that so have you right. so so have you like officially announced that are you no. like we're in a hot because that's a lot of people to gather in in, yeah. in less than a year we're gonna need a full team full team of about six people doing the recruiting vetting uh basically the role uh role architecture of that part so that is the thing we're gonna absolutely have to do uh there's a bit of work work ahead so the budget of hiring a few people full time for like six months uh, in order to do that and getting the funding to do that. So those are the challenges in front of us. I think we'll be able to get the funding for that easily. 
but it, this is an impossible organizational challenge that nobody has done yet. Love it. Well, cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna look forward to seeing it happen. That'll be yeah. that'll be a just even it's one of those things where even even the effort of trying to do it, you're gonna there's there's gonna be so much to gain from just doing that. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm excited to see see where that goes. Um, we need some innovation stuntmen to pave the way. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the 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 crash test dummy of of is is basically where innovation lives. Um, so that that basically covers it for for, for what I had. You know, okay. Any questions that I didn't ask you that you wanted to like address or or anything about that? Um, no, I think we covered a pretty good deal. Um, I think we. I I want to definitely point people uh, whoever's watching this take a look at my four minute TED talk that summarizes the whole scope of what we're doing here. Because we only touched on a few of the sub subjects that we can talk about, but it's a big ambitious project to create a different operating uh, paradigm for how society works. Cool. When you get this thing, when you get the the um, the announcement that this thing is going on, definitely let me know so we can oh, absolutely. get that get the word on that. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where can people, besides, I guess, along with opensourcecology.org, where else yeah. can people find you on the internet and talk to you about yeah, stuff? Yeah, we've got our Facebook page, but if you want to get involved, there's a page on the wiki that's just getting involved. If you get an account on the wiki for editing, you'll get a follow-up with, here's all the ways to get involved. But yeah, the, I mean, the thing we're trying to push forward right now in a big way, I said this, the entrepreneurial aspect. So here's the deal. If you want to learn how to build a 3D printer, for example, as an enterprise, we're the only guys in the world that are going to teach you that. Uh, none of the other companies do that. They, they don't teach their own competition, but we do that. So that's a pretty unique opportunity. And then there's the immersion training to actually start OSC chapters, building the 3D printers, running workshops. That's a business model that we've been doing for a decade. So uh, basically combining education and production and information in one kind of an enterprise package. But we invite you, I mean, if you want to see this project go forward, we've got enterprise substance. Come to us, we'll teach you how to do this. Start start an OSE chapter, start producing the machines that we have. Um, join us. Very cool. Well, cool. Thanks for, thanks yeah. for coming on the podcast. Yeah. And we'll um, be looking forward to see where this goes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jason, for the invite. And we'll talk. Now I'm going to try and do the stopping the recording thing. Yeah. Um, definitely want to see if I can rope you in. I recording mean, has stopped. I mean, you've done <laughs> some of these uh, collaborative events. Yeah, I will tell you more about that. Like once we're actually getting the all the people, we're basically saying here's 2,000 roles. Like it's, a, it's an agile waterfall process, <laughs> meaning that we're going to script out <laughs> the architecture of what all needs to be done and essentially lay out the table of contents for a big Bible book that walks you through every single step of building this house. Um, but then we put, put roles to it. But then again, so I'll talk to you about that and say, hey, do you want to do this? And do you want a house that you can build with a friend in one week for $50,000? So if, if you're in that pool, we're going to be inviting people with the skill set for the, that kind of an offer. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And at the very least, I can spread the word about it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. So, no, that's cool. That's, cool. that's, um, that's exactly what we need, people with experience in, in um, large collaborative events. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. you do, you do uh, primarily Blender work as, uh, for your living? or? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, my, uh, before, before, what I, before my, my current employment i was running a small animation studio in uh richmond virginia doing television production and short films and those kinds of things and having fun doing that um and then i got uh, offered a the, the weirdest application of animation i've ever been involved with i'm i design anti-counterfeit security features for currency <laughs> wow how does that fit together um i animate and it shows up on paper to stop people from copying money so i i fight bad guys with art <laughs> How do you do that? Um, micro optics is the the core technology. So it's in the in the U S in U S money. It's only in the one hundred right now. Um, it's the, the the blue stripe where you tilt it left and right. Things move up and it changes from a one hundred to a Liberty Bell. Um, that's a that's 
so that's, kind of, that's some of the stuff that that, that was done before I got hired, but um, that's the technology that I get to play with. And so um, you see, Micro Optics now is just released in the uh, in Aruba for their their whole series. Actually, has it. Um, we're in like I think over a hundred different denominations at this point around the world. And yeah, it's 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 the weirdest application of animation I have ever been involved with. So because does, it's, I mean, that's that's obviously optics. It's some kind of a physical structure. How does the Blender software or animation play in that? Well, because it, it's it's you're 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 working with depth. You're working with um, very small, very fine geometry, and you have to um, manage the timing. And so it's between building up assets doing the actual animation part of it, which Blender's great for. Blender's node system, which is Python-based, allows you to build out a, you know, we have our own tool set that we actually built as a Blender add-on to allow us to do our own designs. Um, but I mean, how do you go from Blender, so are you talking about a physical copy of paper, of uh, paper mm -hmm. money? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how do you go from so, Blender and in the in internet to, to that? Well, so so we're, we're building the assets for the security feature, right? So the um, so you the actually model itself. the actual animation in Blender, and then they implement it on, into the, in the hardware pa paper copy. That simple. That's a simple way of putting it, but but yeah. So um, by by understanding how the the the, the micro optic system works, and we're talking lenses that are like between seven and twenty three microns across, um, and by taking that, I'm animating. You're basically um, controlling a moray pattern. A what? Um, a moray pattern? A moray pattern. So more moray interference patterns? A moray interference patterns? Not familiar with that so much. Okay. Uh, so if you remember TV back before we actually had HD, um, they would tell you if you ever got on TV, don't wear a shirt with horizontal stripes mm -hmm. because it would interfere with the, the interlacing and it would look like you're jumping. Right? Mm -hmm. It would just be, you'd be uh, jittering the whole time. That's a, that's a moray interference pattern. And I spent years trying to get rid of those patterns in television when I was doing stuff. Um, now, with what I'm doing now, I'm controlling how that more interference pattern produces synthetic images. And those synthetic images are the animations that show up in the micro optics. And so I do animations in Blender that we route through our through software that we wrote in-house that generates the data that runs through the micro optics that our giant presses produce that gets pressed on paper. <laughs> Wow, uh, yeah. and how much of that process is open source? Uh, it's it's most a lot of it's just trade secret and patented because um, you're dealing with trying to stop counterfeiters. So that's the only sort of weird part of that is I'm, my tool set is predominantly open source, um, but I'm doing something that um, for very good reasons. If it's if it if it, that entire tool chain were were fully announced, it'd still be very hard for a counterfeiter to do because just the, the level of precision you need for the machining to actually get that done is you might as well become a competitor rather than you make more money as a competitor than, than as a counterfeiter. <laughs> um, so, but because of that, that's where a lot of that stuff is, is, is in-house and, and, and kept down, which also is, is difficult for the portfolio, by the way, because I can't necessarily tell anybody any particular thing I've worked on. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Well, but because, because the tech, because, because the technology is so interesting, I haven't gotten bored with it yet. So no, I've been doing it for about. That's yeah. pretty cool. Um, so in your Blender modeling, are you actually from that kind of? Do you have to have insight on how the actual technology that implements those images works? Yeah, because there because the, the because there are limitations in yeah. in in you know. If you're talking about animation, how many frames of animation, or you know, you have to have things replaced and and loop cleanly, or um, so you have to have an understanding. It's just like working with with any medium. Actually, if you're talking about television, there's some things you can do in television that you can't really do in film very well. It's that that gap has shrinked substantially, but there's 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 differences just in, in understanding your own medium. Wow. And so, with any art, you have to understand the medium. So you really are the open source creative. That's good. Um, I, I try to be. <laughs> Tell me about your podcast. How many viewers do you know? How many listeners you have? I, I had a well. See, I, I just came back from being on hi hiatus for like, I guess it was two years. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I probably had an audience. It wasn't a large audience. Probably about a thousand listeners every week that was that were listening to it. Um, I'm working my way back up and beyond that now. And the addition of video and actually doing interviews. Because before the um, 
I had what, 40, 42 episodes that I'd recorded. They were all recorded on my work commute. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, that's what I had time to record. I would record, I'd come home, do do the final edits, and and push it out. And that was that was a podcast. That was I mean, the audio quality was, eh, um, but I I like to think that I talked about interesting stuff while driving myself. Um, and I got a listenership based on based on that. But I couldn't safely while driving conduct interviews <laughs> or or do those sorts of things. So uh, also doing video while driving probably also not great or safe. So. Those sort, of, those sort of things kind of kind of hamstring the process. And within the last year or so, I started working from home more frequently. And so my commute sort of disappeared. But also that means that when you don't have to commute an hour each way, um, I also end up with more time at home and I can do things like relaunch my podcast. And then COVID hit. So that was the additional thing on top of all of that. So I'm definitely working from home most of the time. So. Yeah. And um, so... In terms of the the work that you're doing on Blender for the for the anti counterfeiting stuff, are you one of the like the leading subject matter experts in the world on this, or is there a lot of people doing this? Or with with doing it with Blender in particular? No, I mean I got I got hired because they had developed the technology and they were actually using Blender in house to do some of their stuff, but wow. none of them. None of them were, were, they were engineers that were, oh, here's a tool that we can use that the company doesn't have to pay for. Mm-hmm. We should, by the time they got it to a place where it was doing things that were interesting, they're like, well, maybe we should hire an artist that actually knows how to use it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. um, and so they, they, they found me, because at that point I had written, um, I think Blender for Dummies was already in its second edition at that point. Yeah. And um, so they, they, they found me that way. And Wait, did you write Blender for Dummies? I did, I did. Oh, yeah. cool. Um, yeah, the fourth edition just came out in May, March, March. So that's an ongoing project that you keep updating? Yeah, yeah, the, the publisher, I mean, Blender is such a fast-moving target that every two years, it, it's a, almost an entirely different application with new stuff every time. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, and to keep that up to date and, and, and whatnot, it's, it's yeah, about every two years I end up doing another edition of it. Do you, come back do you actually develop for Blender too? Or? I have written really horrible patches. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, that um, they're what I, I've termed them as uh, feature requests that are that are masked as package as as patches. So uh, um, I need Blender to do something. I write a really crappy patch that gets it as far as I can get it to go to do it. I submit it as a patch, and they're like, "I understand where you're going. This is the wrong way to do it. Toss it out. Here's good code that actually does it. Everybody wins." Uh, <laughs> but I've also written um, add-ons. To blender to okay well, that's a good collaborative uh, process what you just described that's 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 the true nature of open collaboration you just throw something yeah. out there and um others yeah. i'm i'm that. i'm really good at making it work ugly and i i rely a lot on other people to make it work properly after that tell me more about so you ran this this 24 video marathon yes yeah, so, so is that your interest too you you like coordinating events too or um i i a little bit, yeah. I, I I found that I enjoyed it. Otherwise, I guess I wouldn't have done it four times in a row. Um, but the the I learn a lot by, especially while from from a workflow standpoint. And my, my my primary interest, especially at that time, was animation, and still is. But animation is an inherently collaborative art form. You really can't. I mean, some people do, but you can't produce large scale work in animation without having a team, um, or like a million years to produce it. It's, it's one or the other. You're either going to have to take forever to do it or you need a lot of people to help you out. And so animation itself is inherently collaborative, which is appealing on, on that front. And um, which also sort of tied me in with, with, with open source and because you can get people to collaborate with you that, like I had an animator that was helping us in South Africa, which was amazing. And otherwise I don't think he would even have access to the software to do it. Um, but it's one of those things that I have a, um, from, from an animation standpoint, from, that's where I was going, from an animation and workflow standpoint, in order to do anything that I was doing commercially, um, putting it through a test of fire by compressing everything that needed to get done within the course of two days really, really lets you know where your bottlenecks are. Like, even if I didn't succeed, like of the four times we did it, we only finished the film uh, that we wanted to two of those four times, so 50% completion rate. But Every time I did it, when I went back to starting doing my freelance work, the next, you know, 
after probably about a day of sleep, when I started um, addressing my, my commercial customers and clients after that, I already had ideas on how to make my workflow faster. I already had ideas on how to optimize if I needed to send a job out to somebody else to sort of sublet the job out. Um, I already knew how to organize my files a little bit better. I had a lot of things that, that really improved my process with that I wouldn't have otherwise done by if I hadn't have put it sort of in that crucible to, to develop wow, man. it. man, that's, that's awesome. I mean, so as far as the thing that's going to happen next year with respect to the, because we're going to need documentation and all kinds of, I mean, basically think about all the assets to sell this house, right? That's, that's going to be a lot of artwork in there too, um, media. I mean, is that kind of a proposition appealing to you? Like to actually yeah. collaborate on that or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it'd be yeah. certainly fun to play on. Um, I have to make sure my wife says okay, but, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think, um, those are the sort of things that I think, um, would be really good, especially if you're, if you're looking at trying to do this with like this time next year, um, you're, you're already under the gun in terms of like trying to organize space, organize people, organize time and get everybody recruited enough today. You're going to have to actually, I think you're probably going to need some well, this of that marketing remote. now. For now we're planning yeah. on remote. Okay. Yeah. Yep, but so, the prototyping is going to have to happen in a few locations. Like we're we're planning on prototyping right here in our our facility with like one hundred people. One of the things that I would, uh, if you have, I mean, I'm sure, you, like in the maker community, they already have like development jams and, and weekend sprints yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But also look at um, the gaming community. They got game jams um, where they will do like heavy software development, asset creation. Um, all of those sort of things. That that community, the community of people who do game jams, game jams. is very vibrant, and um, they're already sort of same thing as with the forty-eight hour film project thing. They're, they're already in that kind of mindset, but you're also dealing with people who are technically minded, already are, understand the concept of open source and and wow. those sort of things. So that might be an avenue worth looking into, though, like sort of tapping into those communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. That's a good hint. No, I didn't know that game jams exist. Really? Yeah, I, f I found out about them because I was talking to somebody about the 40 hour film project and like, well, you think it's of game, game jams? I'm like, game jams? Tell me more. So, <laughs> so for you, it's about compressing like this is a huge learning opportunity. Obviously, I mean, for me, I'm going to see that this is going to be an incredible learning because you're compressing all this activity and just learning so much more. During right. It. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a learning opportunity. And, and when I was doing it, it was specifically around workflow process and efficiency right yeah. i wanted exactly. to be able to do what i do normally um more effectively yeah and that was a really big part of that the other thing is that um i'd already sort of gained a reputation for doing crazy stuff like this and crazy stunts and so um that's part of i think what, what got people on board because oh you did you finished that thing okay well i want to be part of finishing that thing and the fact that we were you know broadcasting it this was again 12 years ago so we were, we were doing live streaming of it before live streaming was really a thing we were doing um, you know showing the project progress as we were working on it um, watching us pass out in the middle of doing the work um, not sleeping for the entire time uh, those 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 components of it that the, the, the stunt aspect of it I think um, spectacle I guess uh, aspect of it can't be undersold because uh, there's, there's, there's a lot to that big part of it that's, that's how you get people to show up yeah 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 awesome cool awesome yeah well, this has been great thanks great. thank thank you so much um i am going to send you an email by the way and i'll be asking for your address because i want to send you something that sort of doing this for for all guests is, is sending them a little thank you so if you could um i'll send you an email asking for that as well thank you and you're gonna be the next episode which i think will be this coming week so i think that'll, that'll work out fairly well awesome so I'll, I'll give you, um, I'll, I'll send you another email as well when that comes out. Okay. Well, Jason, t thanks so much. This is awesome. Maybe we can collaborate on uh, an extreme event. So we'll see what, see what happens. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Oh, Take care. last question oh. though. Uh, last question. Any other recommendations for podcasts that would like to have me? <sighs> Let's see here. Um, there, there are a few, I don't have any listed in front of me, but well, I would maybe, say maybe like you can email me with, uh, when you think of a couple of suggestions, cause I want to just well, get get out there and kind of talk to other people. Like I'd never be talking to a guy like you. Uh, otherwise, um, one of the easiest ones to get into, I think. And it's, it's, it's actually very simple. It, are you familiar with a, with uh, hacker public radio? No. So, H, so they, they go by H HPR. Um, and it is a community run podcast. 
anybody who's listening can submit a show. Oh, and wow. they put they put out a show every single weekday. Oh wow! Uh, oh, that's cool. and so oh, nice. yeah, it, it is it is super cool. The community is is very huh. cool, um, and then the the content is anything that is of interest to hackers and hacker in the traditional sense of people who like to make stuff and, and tinker around. So it's right up your alley. Definitely um, cool. I would I would certainly tell you to get involved with that, with not just that pod that that podcast, but that community is a really good one to, to awesome. get involved with. Awesome. And there are a lot of spinoff. Uh, podcasts from that um, that are that are related to open source and, and how would I find those? Like, are they listed? I could look into some of their shows and look at what spun off. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that would be one way to do it. Um, so there's, and some of them are are like just like one's called You Random, which is literally just randomness and, and more more sort of uh, off the cuff fun stuff. But then um, other ones can be can be more interview type shows or or there's one that's the um, they they circle around the same community. It's the the Linux, Linux Link Tech Show, um, which is a Linux a, Link Tech Show. Yeah, this, I think it's the, the longest running Linux podcast ever, um, and it's just they have fairly long shows that are a lot of people talking about what they're doing with with Linux and open source. But that one would be an interesting one to go by, and a lot of those are are um, fairly easy to talk to. Okay. Um, Floss Weekly, if you want like large larger exposure. That would be a, a certainly one to to try to get yourself on right there. Uh, they're on the Twit network, and so they have they have really long reach in terms of um, in terms of their audience. So Floss Weekly would would certainly be on the list. Um, yeah. And if I think of any other ones, I will I will toss them at you. But those would be the three off the top of my head. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Yeah, for sure. I'll talk okay. to you later. Take care. Bye-bye.